So I've heard people say before that the details of adrenaline-filled moments can stick with you even from childhood and how they can get etched onto your mind's eye like a film strip. Whether that's the broken leg, the first wandering tongue, the power of an adult lie. But from that moment onwards, when the technicolor of existence gets reduced to a series of still frames, your brain starts playing as memory's editor. And the editor stitches and patches, it arranges and rearranges, and imbues the sepia tones with splashes of color. And there's a se <laughs> Dramatic pause. <laughs> 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 I'm going to check a moment. I'm not going to look. Uh, with splashes of color. And the editor... Um, I'm going to do a faux pas. Bear with me. <laughs> this is what happens when you do it for the first time. Anyway, so sometimes there are smash cuts, the stark drama of juxtaposition. And these are the moments that have the power to haunt us and to come knocking when we least expect it. And then there are the quiet moments wrapped in a sort of hazy gauze, the fade to blacks. These moments, they suggest themselves from the corners of our mind and reveal themselves in the darkness, sometimes only themselves, sometimes nothing else. Smash cut. My dad pulls over at the side of the road. The evening sun staccato stutters through the luggage in the back window of our creaky Oldsmobile. It's an impossibly clear Friday that shrugs towards the dwindling spring. But in my mind, I'm already past it to tomorrow, where I'll be just a streak across the, sun, the sand flats that connect Shediac to the sparkling ocean. So we're at the side of the road but I'm stuck in the back middle seat, encroached by the luggage behind and the shoulders on either side, and that pain in the ass hump, and I hate that hump, the physical manifestation of a paper-covered rock. And I'm trying to figure out why we've pulled over. We're only 30 seconds from the house and three hours of rural highways still stretch ahead, but a, a police light coming over the hill suggests an answer and points ahead to the McCaskill kid who's running with a sort of frantic abandon. Are they chasing him or being led? And I can see in, in his face a look that I, that I don't quite recognize that's new to my eight-year-old eyes. It might have been hysterical laughter, but I'll learn later it was a sort of eyes-bulged panic. And by now, boy and police car around the corner, which is strange because it's a dead end, just a path through the woods that every kid uses to go to Lakefield Elementary. And so I crawl over my sister's lap and leave the car and I'm poking around the corner to see what's happened. But then my, my father, he yells back at me and he seems annoyed. We've got to get to Moncton before dark. And so I turn back towards the car, back towards a fade to black. And now it's a few years later and I'm plodding absently around the McCaskill's kitchen with a sort of heavy-footed stoicism. See, Mr. McCaskill, he's the high school principal Sort of, sort of a celebrity in my middle school brain, lording over all these teenagers that up to this point still scare the shit out of me. And it feels strange to have such privi privileged access to this great man's personal world. He had been away on vacation and by some neighborly serendipity had asked me to look, over the, look after the dog, feed it, and let it out twice a day. Help yourself to some snacks and some cable TV, his wife's note had said, with instructions on how to use the remote control free reign. And I think about the upstairs hallway, but then push it from my mind. That wouldn't be right, but I wonder. Smash cut. I deliver the news to her flatly, without any build-up. Sort of like telling her that a storm's coming tomorrow, but that won't affect her plans. I haven't yet learned the performance art of grief. And she's halfway to the kitchen, and Shediac's summer sun is still resting on her brow, and she collapses on top of me and splays out on the half staircase that I had been sitting on, 
like her legs don't work anymore. And she's gasping like she can't really breathe or has forgotten how to speak English. And between that, I can hear some reference to God, God. And I've never seen her disassemble like this. So I rub her back the way I've seen her do to me more times than I can count, my own mother. And guilt and confusion are gnawing away at my attention, drowned out by the vacuum of her grief. Why is she acting like this so violently about a little boy she hardly knew? And why didn't I? What's the weather forecast for tomorrow? Fade to black. Now there's another day a few years later where I'm leaving class and I mention to my teacher that I'm going to, the McCas to Mr. McCaskill's uh, to let out his dog. And I make some passing allusion to the event. And there's no flicker of recognition from her and I remember that she's new to the area and has no idea. And so I tell her what I was just a few paces from seeing that day with my own two eyes. This what seemed to me momentous day in our town's history. And so I tell her that days later, hundreds of people would flood the church up into the back gallery with foldable plastic chairs that overflow out in a big arc around the nave. And I tell her about what happened and how the little boy had been walking through the woods on his way home from school, and he did what little boys do. He climbed a tree. And I told her about the platform at the top of the tree and how when he got up on it, he must have slipped or fallen. And I told her about how his hood on the jacket he was wearing snagged a branch, and how his life snagged a branch. And that horrified look on my teacher's face as I half boasted my omniscience with a sort of hushed solemnity was a smash cut to a dark hallway at the top of the McCaskill stairs. And without thinking, I creep up them one by one as the door frame rises from the carpeted horizon. His room, it's been so many years. God, what's it look like? And my chest is pounding with shamed exhilaration as I reach for it. This isn't right. But still, I turn it and I peek in and inside, I see the room of a seven-year-old boy, sparkling clean. And as the sun drifts lazily through the tree-speckled window, I see a beam of light on the dust-free drawer, and it fades to black. A few days after the funeral, I'm up in my second-story bedroom, allowing the, the guilt and the confusion to fill in that space where I think the sadness is supposed to be, and my gaze reigns over the suburban slanting kingdom below, and I can see the cool bend of my street as it turns at a right angle, avoiding the brackish woods, and coming towards me along the bend, I see the little boy's best friend. He had been on vacation when it happened. They had walked home together every goddamn day but not that day, and no days since. And I'm about you know, two stories above street level, and there's some trees in the way, and maybe I imagined it, there was probably some glare on the outside of the window, but I'm pretty sure the boy looks up, and we lock eyes for just a second. And in that eye contact, I see the interstitial spaces between the still frames of my own life and I think about what if those in-betweens are just a stand-in for that great interstitial, the one that I tell myself now I learned about then, about how we spend so much time obsessing over our control of the darkness just outside of frame that we forget about the light right in the middle. Smash cut to a little boy's pupil and fade to black.